In the last video, we set lots of things on fire, just to put them out, or at least try to. Now it's time to talk about what's really happening inside these kitchen fire suppression systems and what it takes to create a class-leading design. First of all, you need to have electrical knowledge of how electronics work in a modern time. You also need to have mechanical knowledge of the system, so you have to know how much pressure is needed to properly distribute agent through piping. You have to know how nozzles function and flow correctly. You have to know how much pressure is needed to discharge a tank. You have to know the specific gravity of agent and how it flows through pipe, causing dynamic pressure losses. You need a lot of different knowledge. Yeah, there's a lot to cover. But with animations and practical demonstrations, I hope we can make it all click together for you in a fun way. We'll be using our core and tank systems to apply these methods and concepts. In the end, you should walk away with a lot more knowledge of our systems, but also the world around you. So without further ado, let's get started. The laws of physics and fluid dynamics govern how a fluid like these fire suppressing agents travel through a system. And the most basic and fundamental principles are sometimes intuitive and sometimes not. That's because the way we interact with fluids on a daily basis is pretty limited. Maybe you put your thumb on a hose and notice that you can make the stream go further, but this doesn't give you much insight into what's happening inside the hose at different points. The most basic concept to start with is the continuity equation. Let's say we have a length of pipe with a constant diameter and some water running through it. If we pick two arbitrary points along the pipe, we could say that the amount of water flowing past one point has to equal the amount of water flowing through the other point. This is pretty intuitive, right? The pipe is the same diameter. It's not like more water will be flowing through here than here or vice versa. It'll flow through both points in the same amount and at about the same speed. So we can express this as this equation, showing that the mass flow is equal on both points. I will point out that we're making a couple assumptions here. We assume that the fluid is incompressible, which except for extreme cases is true for all liquids, and we also assume that the density of the fluid isn't changing. So here, as long as the temperature remains constant, this is true. Now, what happens if the diameter of the pipe changes between these two points? Well, this equation remains true, but we know that the bigger diameter pipe can hold a bigger quantity of water, right? This means that the water moving through this larger diameter section has to be moving slower than the water moving through the smaller section. Think of floating down a river. When the river is wide and deep, the water moves really slowly. But when you get to a narrow or shallow section, the water speeds up. And this is because the same mass of water is moving the whole time. So the speed changes according to how big the cross-sectional area of the river is. And the same goes for the pipe. In fact, we can change the equation to reflect this. And our two parameters become the velocity of the fluid and the cross-sectional area of the pipe. If we measure the velocity at point one, we can solve for the velocity at point two since we know the cross-sectional area at both sections. Now, way back in the 1700s, a Swiss mathematician named Daniel Bernoulli looked at this concept and thought, hmm, so the velocity is changing, but what about the pressure? And what is pressure anyways? Pressure, or more specifically, a pressure difference, is what makes the fluid move through the pipe in the first place. And we can say that pressure is a force exerted over a certain area. A simple example is a syringe filled with fluid. Let's say I apply 10 pounds of force on the plunger, which has an area of one square inch. This is then 10 PSI. I'm pushing into these molecules, who in turn push into other molecules, and the ripple effect is that this pressure of 10 PSI is transmitted to all the walls in the syringe. Everywhere we measure, the force will be 10 pounds per square inch. This is called static pressure. So say we have a pump now that is pushing enough volume of water to exert 10 PSI of pressure into the fluid in the pipe. And on the other side of the pipe, we just have atmospheric pressure. Then the difference in pressure, or in other words, the difference in applied forces, will cause the fluid to move in this direction. And Bernoulli said, look, if the diameter remains constant, then the static pressure here, here, and here will all be the same, kind of like this syringe, until the fluid exits into the atmosphere and the pressure drops. 
But what if the pipe diameter changes? We already established that this would have an effect on the velocity of the fluid, but now Bernoulli says if velocity decreases, then the static pressure will increase. The pressure in this part of the pipe, where the fluid is moving quickly, will be lower than the pressure in this part, where it's moving slower. This is often referred to as Bernoulli's principle. And to many people, this just seems wrong. You've put your thumb on the hose and the resulting spray seems to have more force, but that's because it has more speed, and that's kind of exactly the point. When the molecules move in a more uniform vector, there is less of this random motion that creates static pressure in the first place. So let's actually look at Bernoulli's equation to understand more. And I know, first this seems really complicated, but it's actually not that bad. To start off, let's just ignore these terms here. We'll get to them later. This equation says that at any point in the pipe, the sum of the static pressure and the velocity of the fluid equals the sum of the static pressure and velocity at any other point in the pipe. In other words, the sum of static pressure and velocity are always constant along the pipe. So if the static pressure increases, the velocity must decrease and vice versa. You can think of each of these terms as a measure of a part of the energy in the system. So when we add both of them together, we get a certain amount of energy. And since energy is conserved, this energy will remain the same at any point in our pipe. For this reason, Bernoulli's equation is also sometimes called the law of energy conservation. Now let's go back and look at the complete equation again. The term rho here factors in the density of the fluid in question. And this third segment, I think, is actually pretty intuitive. It's there to account for any change in height of the fluid. This height is potential energy that must be considered, and we use the term g to incorporate the force of gravity the fluid is experiencing. So generally speaking, if we have a constant diameter pipe that rises, the resulting pressure at the top will be lower than at the bottom. But now that energy has been transferred into potential energy. You can rearrange this equation to verify this, and you know, feel free to do that for yourself if you want. Bernoulli's equation is a fundamental concept in the study of fluid dynamics, but it's not without its flaws. On top of the assumptions already made by the continuity equation, Bernoulli also assumes that the fluid experiences no friction, and that the flow is steady or streamlined. This kind of flow is called laminar flow, in which the molecules follow these perfect paths and they don't really interact with each other. But in the real world, turbulent flow is much more prevalent. This is a flow in which the fluid swishes around in what are called eddy currents. This extra motion in all kinds of directions takes energy, but a lot of that energy isn't useful. It ends up going against the desired flow, resulting in generation of heat and ultimately fluid energy loss. I know this has all been really theoretical, so let's try to put it all in practice and see it with our own eyes. All right, so I've got this little setup that consists of a five gallon bucket filled with water and I've dyed the water blue so you can see it. Then we have this half inch clear pipe that rises up clamped onto this light stand and the clamps are not pinching it, they're just holding it in place. So let's see what happens when we turn the pump on. Oh, that was pretty close. You can see the water doesn't just keep going and flows out of the top. There's enough gravitational force on this column of water to keep that from happening because the pump can only pump to a certain pressure. Now, we could take the measurement from the pump to here in inches, and that would tell us the pressure in inches of water column. If you ever heard of that measurement, this is it. And we can refer to this as head pressure coming out of the pump. This pump is rated at six and a half feet water column of head pressure. I'm 6'2", six six and a half ish It seems like it's doing its job. Now, one interesting thing is that inches of water column can be measured with any diameter pipe. I have a half inch, I could use a quarter inch, one inch, and the height would always be the same. As an extreme example, say we had an Olympic swimming pool with this pump at the bottom of it pumping water into it. Eventually, the level would reach six and a half feet. The width of the water column on top of it doesn't matter, it's just the height. So let's take the idea of using just a pipe as a really simple pressure gauge to visually and practically explore some of these fluid dynamics concepts. Here we have a stream of water moving in this direction. The diameter of this pipe is a quarter inch, and this one's a half inch. So the heights of the two columns of water show the pressure at these points, the larger diameter pipe showing quite a bit more pressure. 
This is right in line with Bernoulli's equation, with height being equal. And again, we just have a trade-off of velocity and pressure of the fluid. At point A, the velocity is high and the pressure is low. And at point B, the velocity is low, but the pressure is high. Meaning the energy is the same, just in different forms. Now, here's a pipe that's a constant half-inch diameter, with a rise of about two feet. You can see that when I have no flow, these pressures reach the same height relative to the pump that's on the ground. But when I let the water flow, the pressure decreases as there's a place for the water to go. And notice that the pressure here is much lower than here. And that's because we have quite a bit of height and thus gravitational force to overcome. This is again right in line with Bernoulli's equation, with velocity being equal. At point A, the pressure is high, but the gravitational potential is low. And at point B, it's pretty much the opposite. But if you look closely, you see that the water level is slightly lower here relative to the pump. And that's because while the fluid traveled through this length of pipe, it experienced some energy losses due to friction. And now we're getting away from Bernoulli's and into some of these effects that happen in reality. To illustrate this one better, I've taken height out of the equation. And you can see that when the fluid is flowing, there's a bit of pressure drop along this length of pipe. We know the velocity of the water remains the same since the diameter doesn't change, meaning this is effectively a loss in the energy of the fluid. So if I switch this length here with a smaller diameter pipe, what happens? The pressure loss is way bigger. Let's zoom out. We know that since the mass flow through this whole contraption is constant, then when the water is going through this tiny pipe, it has to speed way up, introducing a bunch more turbulence, friction, and loss of energy. By the time the fluid gets back to this bigger pipe, it doesn't even come close to matching the original pressure. You can see the difference in speed in these bubbles in the fluid, and just how much faster the fluid has to travel through the smaller diameter pipe. But there's also a loss just from the turbulence introduced by the fitting. If you think about it, the water has to take some turns to make it through it. This is even more evident in something like this elbow. We go from a fairly laminar flow to this twirly, turbulent mess. In order to quantify this, manufacturers of fittings like valves, elbows, and tees publish an associated k-factor for the local loss coefficient. This is a number that allows for the calculation of the flow rate given a certain pressure. It basically tells you how resistant to flow the fitting is. Here's a visual for just how much pressure loss a few elbows can cause. And in the field, it's common to associate a fitting or elbow with a corresponding length of pipe that causes the same pressure drop. So for example, we may say each of these elbows is equivalent to two feet of pipe of the same diameter. We'll see in a little while how this might come in handy. The manifolds that distribute the agent in these systems have to contend with all these effects and even some more. I put together this little dividing manifold with five branches or lateral lines to simulate our different nozzle drops. In this setup, all the tubing is a quarter inch in diameter. And what you'll notice right away is that the flows out of each branch are extremely uneven. But also, you might think that the flows would progressively decrease as we moved away from the source, the pump in this case. But the last container has more fluid in it than the fourth and even the third container. So this is telling us that there's even more real life physics at play, which are causing effects that Bernoulli just can't explain. And for example, if the branches were further apart, we might be seeing something different. So how do we fix this? How do we make the distribution of fluid more even across the branches? Well, here's the same setup, but I stepped up the manifold line diameter to a half inch. Now the distribution is much more even, which is what we want. And look, I spent a few hours looking into these manifold effects to possibly explain some of them, looked at all kinds of articles and scholarly papers in the topic, but in the end, my conclusion is that manifolds are just very complex. We have all these different parameters and forces, turbulences, friction, momentum, and it goes a bit beyond what the purpose of this video is. But what I can say is that every setup for every manifold that's factory installed with either our core or our tank systems has undergone testing and verification to make sure it will deliver consistent, accurate flows out of every nozzle. And the same cannot be said for other fire systems that are designed and installed in the field. We can provide the best outcome for customers if we pre-pipe the fire suppression system. So for tank and core, both are pre-piped from the factory. Other hood manufacturers don't value that as much, and they rely on 
fire system distributors to actually pipe the fire suppression systems in the field. Can you imagine as a customer receiving your hood? Oh, by the way, now you have to run all these pipes and detection lines through it. There's a lot of variability that can go into that. If you've ever looked at a fire suppression manual, you know, you're talking hundreds of pages of, of design guides and what to do, what not to do, this limitation, that limitation. How do you know that's being done correctly in the field? How do you know that the pressure at the first nozzle is going to be correct, not too high, not too low? When this is done in the factory, we account for all that automatically through software, and we actually add the right amount of pipe length or fittings to ensure the nozzle pressures are exactly right. One very important consideration is how many nozzles to install and how far apart to place them. The typical spacing is 36 inches apart, but this can change with more heavy duty applications or applications that require appliance specific drops, like this broiler, which requires a nozzle pointing inside the cooking chamber. Captive Air does all the legwork in figuring out how this affects the construction of the system, but this varies for tank and core. With tank, the agent in any single tank is split between however many nozzles are connected to it. So while more nozzles may seem like a good idea, more nozzles means that each nozzle gets less flow. Even with our simple example, you can see that the more we branch out of our manifold, the less each branch will flow. So to stay within parameters, Captive Air uses a flow point system. Our system assigns 20 flow points to each individual tank. At 36 inch spacing, Standard overlapping protection allows us to use five nozzles per tank, each nozzle receiving four flow points. Think of these points as literal scoring points. As long as we don't go over 20 points, we're good. As I said, some heavy duty appliances do require more flow. So say we had a bunch of deep fryers under the hood. In this case, we would space the nozzles a maximum of 30 inches apart, and we would only use four nozzles per tank. Each nozzle would receive five flow points. So fewer nozzles per tank spaced closer together means more agent will be delivered to each of the fryers. If we had a longer hood, then it's very likely that we'd have to add more tanks to properly cover the appliances. And again, each new tank gets another 20 flow points to be distributed accordingly. This is pretty different to what happens with core. With core, the amount of nozzles in the hood determines how much incoming pressure is required at the inlet of the core manifold. And since standard spacing is 36 inches, we even have charts that are specific for each hood length. So if we had a 32 foot hood with a one inch manifold, we would need a minimum pressure at the inlet of the hood of 35 PSI. Captive Air gives us a few other parameters too. For example, we can assume a flow rate of one and a half gallons per minute per lineal foot of hood, meaning this 32 foot hood would flow 48 gallons per minute. They also provide us with numbers for non-standard configurations. So if we had additional nozzles, each one would add an equivalent length of eight inches of hood in this chart and an additional one gallon per minute of flow. For now though, let's stick with a standard 32 foot hood. And I want to go into how these numbers are useful for a core installation. The core water line that's used for fire suppression can be connected to either a domestic water system which is your typical water used for sinks, showers, hoses, etc. But it can also be connected to a building's sprinkler system, which is dedicated just for the purpose of fighting fires. Let's start off with an example using a domestic water line. Say we have this 32 foot hood here and a domestic water main line here. We already know that this hood with a one inch manifold requires 35 PSI of pressure at the inlet. And let's say this water main is showing 50 PSI. Great, we can just connect the two with some one inch pipe and we're good to go, right? Not necessarily. We have to use three elbows and 30 feet of pipe to make this connection. And we have this vertical rise here of five feet. We have 15 PSI to work with here. That's our allowable pressure drop through this field installed pipe to make sure we still hit 35 PSI at the hood. Captive Air provides all the charts needed to calculate the pressure drop using simple math. So yeah, sorry Bernoulli. First, we can calculate the equivalent length of pipe for the three elbows. And we see that each one is equivalent to 2.6 feet of pipe. So we have 30 feet of actual pipe plus our elbows, which gives us a total equivalent length of 37.8 feet. To find the friction pressure drop along this length, we can consult the next chart which gives us the pressure drop per foot correlated to the predicted flow. 
Remember, we had 48 gallons per minute, so we'll use the value from 50 to be safe. So the math is 0 0.573 times 37.8 feet, and the result is a friction pressure drop of 21.6 psi. This is already higher than our allowed pressure drop of 15 psi, so this diameter of pipe isn't going to work. We're going to have to increase the diameter. So let's try a 1.5 inch pipe then. We can consult the charts and replace all these values with this new diameter. The equivalent length for the elbows is now 4 feet per elbow, giving us a new equivalent length of 42 feet. We take this and then we need to change the pressure drop per foot, which for this diameter is much, much less at 0.078 psi per foot. And now we only have a friction drop of 3.28 psi. The bigger pipe is much better at maintaining pressure. We're still not done though. We need to calculate the gravitational pressure drop introduced by the five feet of rise in the piping. So let's have a look. Here we have a five foot rise in the pipe, but on the other side, we drop one foot. And really what we're looking for is the net change in height in the whole system. So in this case, we care about the four feet of net rise. But why? When the water is first making its way up the pipe, it does have to overcome all five feet of height and its associated pressure drop. But once it goes across and it's coming back down, it regains exactly one foot water column of pressure. Since this system will be full of water all the time, this siphon effect is to our advantage. And again, all we need is the height delta of four feet. From here, it's easy. Remember, the diameter of the pipe doesn't matter. So this is a constant of 0.43 psi per foot, also given in the manual. That gives us a gravitational pressure drop of 1.72 psi. And if we add this drop to our friction pressure drop, we get a total pressure drop across this whole run of 5 psi, using the 1.5 inch pipe. Meaning we're good. We should see about 45 psi at the hood. We only needed 35, so this works, and it works well. We simply cannot overstate just how important it is to run this kind of calculation and make sure that the pressure at the hood is going to be sufficient to actually put out the fire. And this is especially true when we're dealing with a domestic water supply like we just did in our example. In most cases, domestic water comes into the building through a 1 inch to a 2 inch main line, meaning they're not really designed to handle huge volumes of water. There's also generally a backflow preventer, or check valve basically, that keeps contamination from the building from ever reaching the city supply. This device can drop the pressure up to 10 psi in some cases. You also have to consider that other appliances are feeding off of this line too, so the best practice is to always use a dedicated line for core, just like we did in our example. If instead we had tapped into this line that went into the sink, then the pressure available for core when the sink was in use would be even lower, which would have to be taken into account. On the other hand, building sprinkler systems are designed for much, much higher flows, sometimes upwards of over a thousand gallons a minute at pressures like 150 psi. Just look at this sprinkler main, it's huge. Typically there's little concern about not having enough water pressure or flow when hooked up to a sprinkler system. However, if you do choose to go this route, it means you're going to be working with the sprinkler contractor, which is simple enough once you understand some of the terminology. So when, when you're working with sprinkler contractors, there's two terms that they typically use, actually three terms that they use on a regular basis. There's residual pressure, static pressure, and something called K-factor. So static pressure is when your building suppression system is not flowing, what is the pressure inside those pipes? So for example, there may be 150 PSI of pressure inside of a building fire suppression piping system without any flow. Residual pressure is after the system is flowing for a period of time, where does the pressure end up? So if a certain number of sprinkler heads or outlets are opened up, where does that pressure end up? And that might be down to 50 PSI, for example. So your static may be 150, and your residual with flow may be 50 PSI. Those are two important terms. The other one is K-factor. So every sprinkler head has a flow rating to it and the industry calls this K-factor. So based on the K-factor, there's a standard formula that sprinkler contractors can use 
to determine how much flow and how much pressure is needed at the main entry of the fire suppression system. And you can look at core very simply as one outlet or one flow point for the building fire suppression system. It has a K factor built into it. So a sprinkler head over here may have one K factor, a sprinkler over here may have another K factor. The core system can be defined as one K factor on that bigger system. This little mock-up really shows how this works. We have a source of water flowing into the system in this direction. Then we have these two branches. We can pretend this branch is the building sprinkler system, and this one is the core fire suppression system. Right now, this water column gauge is measuring the static pressure right before the core system. The water is not moving. If I open the building sprinkler system, you can see that the remaining residual pressure left for core drops. So static pressure, residual pressure, and back to static. It's important to know both to make sure core is in the right window of pressures for both scenarios. But just like the sprinkler system being on affects the available pressure for core, core being on affects the pressure available for the sprinklers. This is why engineers designing the sprinkler system need to know the K factor of the core system. That will allow them to calculate how much pressure will be left in the system in the unlikely scenario that both have to operate at the same time. We present a K factor and a minimum pressure requirement and flow requirement to the sprinkler contractor. Once the sprinkler designer plugs in our K factor into their design software, they can determine how much static pressure and how much residual pressure is needed to properly cover our system in the event of a fire. Overall, it's not that complicated. It just has to be accounted for in the design of the building. Just like you would add a sprinkler over an office space or a piece of industrial equipment. The same thing goes for core. It's just another operation within a building that has to be protected. So for core, we rely on the building pressure to push that water through our system. Whereas in tank, we actually pressurize the agent tank itself. And that powers the system and pushes the agent through the system. We pressurize the tanks at the factory with 200 PSI of nitrogen. We use nitrogen because it's less of a corrosive agent than oxygen would be, and it's a widely available material. Nitrogen also isn't flammable like oxygen, and so it's a good medium to be putting this agent through the tanks. One of the biggest questions I get is why is the tank so heavy? And there's a lot that goes into that. You know, we could make a smaller tank we could use less internal pressure in the tank, but every one of these decisions affect the overall cost and coverage that the system offers. So the tank is heavy because we want a good amount of coverage along the hood. So we need to carry more agent within that tank. And with more agent, we need more pressure in the tank. And when those two things combine, the tank has to get physically larger. And as the pressure climbs in the tank, it has to get physically thicker. To figure out just how thick to make the tanks, engineers use a simple formula for something called hoop stress. Hoop stress is the tensile stress experienced by the cylindrical walls of a pressure vessel like our tanks. The pressure difference from inside the tank to the atmosphere causes the material to want to stretch in this direction. Ensuring the tank material can withstand these forces is crucial to avoid failure. The variables are the internal pressure in the tank, the mean radius of the tank, and finally, the thickness of the tank walls. Let's plug in some rough numbers for our tank. We know we pressurized to 200 PSI, and let's say the mean radius is six inches and the wall thickness is an eighth of an inch. If we do the math, we get a hoop stress of 9,600 PSI. So how do we use this number? Well, at this point, we have to compare this hoop stress to the yield strength of the material. This is the point at which a material will permanently deform. So let's say our steel has a yield strength of 60,000 PSI. That means we've got a pretty large safety margin here in that the yield strength is just over six times the calculated hoop stress. So this configuration would work, but you could play around with the equation to optimize the wall thickness to meet any desired safety factor while keeping the vessel as light as possible. Okay, so now that we've figured out how much agent we need, how much pressure is in the tank, and how to build a strong enough tank to handle both, one question remains. How do you get the agent that's in that tank to discharge correctly onto a fire? 
It's very easy to think about it, but hard to do in practicality. If you look at a handheld extinguisher, there's a handle that you actually squeeze. And by squeezing it, you're putting a lot of force on a valve, probably hundreds of pounds of pressure on a valve to allow that pressure to push the agent out. In a tank system, you have to do the same thing, but you can't have someone manually standing there with a, a lever to activate the system. So you have to do it mechanically or electronically or pneumatically. We've chosen to do it pneumatically. And one unique thing about the way we do it is we use the stored pressure in the tank to actually overcome the same pressure in the tank. We're using 200 PSI to overcome 200 PSI. Let's take a practical look at this using syringes. These two are the same size, so when I apply any force to the plunger, it'll move down. As it does this, it will compress the air in the chamber, and the opposite plunger will move up due to this pressure. If I now apply equal force to both, nothing happens, nothing moves. But now, let's see what happens if we apply equal force, but change the diameter of these syringes. The smaller syringe will go down. This phenomenon is called the ratio of cylinders. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Let's say these weights are each one pound, and this syringe has a cross section of one square inch. while well, this one is two square inches. Then the pressure created on this side is one pound per square inch, one PSI, while on this one, it's only half of a PSI. In reality though, the whole system will be at this higher pressure. So if we rearrange the equation and plug in one PSI for both, in the corresponding areas, we'll see that the force with which this syringe pushes back is twice as high as that of this one. And that's why this plunger ends up going up. Notice though that the amount of vertical movement varies. And this is simply due to the volume of air displaced. We can even move a heavier weight on this side due to the mechanical advantage gained by the different ratio of cylinders. This idea is used in all kinds of machines and it works even better with hydraulic systems like the brakes in your car. The guys at R&D explained to me how this concept was implemented into the release mechanism for tank. So let's do a quick overview of the components and how it all works. The tank itself is filled with a wet chemical agent and then charged with nitrogen to bring the pressure up to 200 PSI. Since the tanks are stored vertically, the nitrogen stays up top. This port here is exposed to the 200 PSI from the tank, so this hose carries this pressure to this T. On the other side of the T is where the tank pressure is monitored, using a pressure transducer or switch. Right after the T is the release solenoid. This 24 volt solenoid is normally closed. During a fire condition, the solenoid energizes, opening a small port through which the 200 PSI of nitrogen flows. Because the port is so small, a strainer is installed right before the solenoid to keep any debris from clogging this passage. Once the nitrogen passes the solenoid, it goes through a check valve which is there to ensure the solenoid only sees pressure and flow in this direction. The nitrogen is then piped through a T and into the actuator body. The body has a cylindrical chamber within which a piston can slide. When the chamber is pressurized with nitrogen, the pressure tries to push the piston down. Opposite to this piston is a plunger which normally seals the tank, and the two can touch. Now, as long as the tank is pressurized, the plunger, which has a relatively small diameter, is exposed to 200 PSI of nitrogen from within the tank. On the other hand, this actuator piston has a much larger diameter. And when the system is activated, the piston is also exposed to 200 PSI of nitrogen. We can then determine that the total force on this piston is higher than on this plunger, which in the end causes both to travel downward, opening up this cavity which is normally sealed by the plunger. With the plunger open, the pressure inside the tank causes agent to rapidly flow up the siphon tube and into the distribution manifold and nozzles, putting out the fire. While this may seem like a lot of components, there are very few moving parts and the benefits of using pneumatic activation really shine when using multiple tanks. Since we've already tapped 200 PSI of pressure out of this tank, we can pipe up to four of these actuators together and they will all become pressurized when this release solenoid is energized. At Captive Air, we call this entire assembly the primary actuator kit. Within it is the primary valve actuator, 
And when we have more tanks, like in this scenario, we call these secondary valve actuators. And again, the 200 PSI of stored pressure in this tank is controlled by one solenoid to operate up to four tanks. But what happens to this pressure as the system is activated? There's a lot of dynamics going on when the tank is emptying. The first thing is the tank pressure is pushing down on the agent, which is forcing agent up through a siphon tube. You want to time it so that you don't have too much nitrogen or excessive pressure, and you don't have a lot of pressure left over at the end of a discharge. But you have to have it so that the pressure left in the tank when the agent is almost empty is still enough to overcome all the losses in the system. So it may start at 200, and at, as the tank empties, it may drop down to say 50 PSI inside the tank. That still has to be enough pressure to develop full flow along all nozzles. Since the pressure in a tank drops during activation, it wouldn't be smart to rely on this pressure to constantly open up the plunger. So instead, a mechanical detent is incorporated into the actuator mechanism, which locks the actuator piston in the downward position, or open, meaning once the system is activated, it'll stay activated while the agent fully discharges. This redundant feature is why when tank discharges, there's no stopping it, and this does have some other effects. Remember, once the system is activated, be it manually or automatically, the built-in software can take other actions, such as closing the gas valve or ramping up the exhaust fans, like we mentioned in the last video. For this to happen though, the software has to latch on to a fire condition. In other words, it has to commit to it. With Tink, once the release solenoid opens, the actuating valves will pressurize and move almost instantly, engaging the detent pin right away. Because of this, the software in a tank system latches onto a fire condition in a matter of milliseconds, and it has to, there's no going back. With Core, it's quite different. We just have some large solenoid valves that can be opened or closed on command. So in software, we can delay latching onto a fire condition for a couple of seconds. Why do this though? Simply in case of an accidental trigger. You'd have at least two seconds to say, never mind. And although the valve opened right away, it can just close and maybe just a little bit of water dumps out of the nozzles. This is just one example of how software has to be optimized for each system. And speaking of accidental discharges, there's one feature that had to be added to tank to prevent this very thing. A small pressure relief in the last actuator in the system. Although the release solenoid is an extremely reliable piece of hardware, it's not out of the question that it could develop a very slow leak. Over time, this leak could result in enough pressure getting through the solenoid to cause system activation, even when there's not a fire. So a tiny pressure relief can slowly vent this leak pressure to prevent any nuisance trips. And if the system does need to be activated, the port is so small that it simply has no effect on the system's operation. Accidental discharges don't happen that frequently. We have thousands of systems out in the field. We've only had a handful of accidental discharges, but we want that rate to be zero. We don't want any interrupted cooking for unintended purposes. The goal should always be a flawless system. I mean, we're talking about life safety here. And as much as there was to learn in this video about science and physics, a big takeaway should be this continuous improvement approach and the pride these engineers take in their products. It's been a lot of fun and it's been very educational. I'm not gonna say it hasn't been stressful because it has been stressful. As a matter of fact, every single fire that we have, I'm on full alert, like, did I do something wrong? Did I miss something in this application? That's where my mind goes first and then Knowing that we've had a perfect track record with tank and core, we've never not once not been able to suppress a fire. That gives me peace of mind that we've done the right things. So the development process has been very fun, but just dealing with life safety issues, you're always, you're always concerned. I hope you enjoyed watching this two-part series as much as I like making it. Don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos and maybe even leave a comment uh, with some feedback or what you'd like to see next. And once again, I wanna say thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.